We might get started. So if I can ask people to take a seat. We are in the session entitled Archives in a Time of Governance Change. So hello everyone uh, and welcome. My name is Justine Hazelwood. Um, I'm the Keeper of Public Records in Victoria, Director of the Public Record Office in Victoria, which is the State Archives in Victoria, and I'll be moderating today's session. Uh, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land we are meeting on, the Wajuk Noongar people. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and I acknowledge their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life of this city and this region. Uh, all three of our speakers today will be touching on the role that records play in the governance of our polities, particularly as they relate to the accountability of our governments to citizens. How do government archives contribute to accountability? What's our role when governance fails? Perhaps our speakers can, uh, can enlighten us today. Each of our speakers have uh, promised me that they'll be speaking for a short amount of time. <laughs> And then we will open it up for questions. So I hope you've got lots stored up and I hope they prompt lots of questions with their talks. Um, I'm going to start by introducing our first speaker. John uh, Longolong is currently the board chairman at the Government Employee Superannuation Board, the Northern Territories Water and Power Corporation, Westpac Banking w Group WA, Pawsey Supercomputer Centre, Rottnest Island Authority and the, the Dampier to Bunbury Gas Pipeline. Uh, John is also a director of the National Disability Insurance Agency and also holds chair positions with uh, Telethon Kids Institute, CEDA WA, the Committee for Perth and Art Trinsic. And I guess the main reason why he's here is he recently completed a special inquiry for the state government of WA into government programs and projects covering the period 2008 to 17. Please welcome John. Thank you very much, Justine. And hello, ladies and gentlemen. It's terrific to be here and have the opportunity of um, discussing some of the findings which we reached uh, in the special inquiry, and most particularly to adapt it to your interests, uh, the importance of information and data, which was critically uh, important to this inquiry. Um, I have had a long history in Western Australia, as you just gathered, um, uh, and I welcome everybody from out of state uh, to this jurisdiction. It's always good to get a few Eastern Staters here, but if there's anyone in the room who barracks for Collingwood, you could leave now, and, um, <laughs> and then we'll have a far more, acumony, a far more pleasant discussion, I'm sure. Um, as Justine mentioned, um, when the current Labor government was elected uh, in March of 2017, it came to government with, as most governments do, uh, a desire to have a look at what happened in the past so it could determine what it should do into the future and avoid some of the mistakes of the past. And the period which uh, it was following, that is the period of the previous government, which was an eight-year government, was a great period of expansion in Western Australia and a disastrous period for financial management in Western Australia to the extent that WA on a, uh, a GDP basis has one of the highest levels of debt at the state government level of all jurisdictions. So I was asked, um, and I won't go into why I was asked, but I was asked to come and have a look at what went on. Um, the special inquiry, as it was called, um, gave me great powers, not quite to the Haynes Royal Commission status, but pretty close. I could summon anybody I liked, and most particularly, I could summon information. And that was really powerful for uh, what we were asked to do. Um, as you can see from this first slide, the government's undertaken a few inquiries, so we are one of four. Um, what that means for the public sector of Western Australia is it's been under huge pressure to provide information. Each of those inquiries are separate, uh, one is still ongoing, the Sustainable Health Review, and that's due to be completed at the end of this calendar year. One of the features of government, and I won't just limit this to Western Australia, but one of the features of government is that in recent times they ask for these inquiries 
and they, generally speaking, do very little with them. And I think what that has done has bred a hell of a lot of compla complacency across government administration, uh, and we found it uh, in spades in many areas of the review we undertook. The sad reality for you all, ladies and gentlemen, as you read this list of inquiries at the bottom of this slide, in one way or another, I was involved in every one of them. So in terms of my mark out of 10 for being successful, I think I'm running at about two. Uh, but hope springs eternal. Something might happen into the future. The terms of reference, uh, like all of these good inquiries, uh, the terms of reference were quite broad. Uh, but they weren't universal. We weren't asked to have a look at the whole public sector. We weren't asked to look at every nook and cranny. We were quite targeted. We were asked to have a look at 31 specific projects and programs. Um, those 31 stretched across the largest areas of government, um, but many areas of government equally were not uh, impacted by us. And we were asked to do a lot of things, as the slide um, tells you in particular to have a look at business cases uh, and to determine the adequacy of those cases and how they impacted on um, decision making. We had a relatively short period of time. We were given six months uh, and we had a relatively small budget, one and a half million people. We were staffed primarily by public servants. So what did that mean? Well, what it meant was we knocked on the door of each of those 31 agencies and quite a few more and said, I hope you're ready to give us a lot of information because we need a lot of information. Um, and we, we did uh, demand that in se separate exercises. Initially, let them know th this was the broad scope of what we were going to do, um, ask them for information, ask them to volunteer information relating to the matters we were having a look at. Um, and then after we had that information and had drilled into it, we then targeted specific data requirements and information requirements. Uh, and then we asked senior officers from each of the 31 agencies to come and have a talk to us. Um, and I had the powers of a Royal Commissioner in that instance. Uh, people were under oath to give evidence. So the quality of the data that they had given us, we used very strategically in prizing open issues and asking them for more material. And then they had another chance at coming back to us with even more material. Now, I might say, when I talk to you about this issue, don't think this is just a public service issue. Have a look at the Royal Commission into the finance system that is being undertaken today. The private sector is as exposed to these matters as the public sector is. Uh, and we're about to have a Royal Commission into the age sector. Here it goes again, across broad areas of the economy and the community, not just into the public sector. But for the moment, I'm just going to talk to you about the public sector. So just some information demands. These inquiries rely on a lot of information. It's not acceptable for agencies to say resource constraints prevent the provision of information. We had a few agencies say that to us. We said, bad luck. Go back and try harder. Um, we made demands on agencies, as I've mentioned, um, and we held those people accountable to the the information they gave us at hearings. The availability of information, even though most organisations were subject to the same requirements of the state, that is the Records Act and the Data Management Act and all the other uh, acts of the government, the, the data availability across the agencies varied remarkably. A good number of agencies were able to give us good information quickly. Probably an equal number of agencies took a long time to give us that information because they just had difficulty finding it. And a smaller number of agencies just couldn't find the information, even though we were asking for information just eight years back. Uh, and I'll give you some examples of that in a moment. What was going on? I think there were, and there is, across almost every area of activity, every area of business, every area of government, there is a reducing um, attention to the detail of actually maintaining records. Uh, maintaining records in a understandable form, uh, particularly when you're pulling them out later and some of the people who are associated with meetings and other matters have left, um, and just in a comprehensive form. One of the most disturbing areas we had were minutes of meetings. Even at 
um, government trading enterprise, that is corporations levels, where directors have the same responsibilities as, uh, as directors of public corporations, why couldn't they find minutes? Why were their minutes uh, inadequate? Why were they too abridged? Why were they short on detail? And why were they subject to different interpretations? The art of taking minutes, I suggest to you, is an art that we need to restore. And there's another aspect which we noticed was just the overall um, reduction in attention to detail, attention to due process across government agencies, which I think is white hatting the records management process. There are a few examples. Um, last night when I pulled all these together, you would have need a, mic a microscope right up close to read these, but, uh, or a magnifying glass. So I reduced them and gave you um, some opportunity to be able to read it. You'll have copies of these slides afterwards. Across the trading enterprises, for instance, what we call trading enterprises in Western Australia, so they're two big energy entities, Western Power and Synergy, um, we had really interesting experiences. These are quasi-commercial entities run by boards of directors, uh, primarily of people, of boards consisting of uh, non-public servants, people who are business people by any other profession. Um, in both cases, were almost unable to give us any information of real significance on their contracting arrangements. Uh, and Western Power had the view that it wasn't subject to the same level of uh, data management and information management as the normal public sector because it wasn't actually a public sector agency. Um, and then when you keep looking through these and have a look at some other examples, uh, this next set stretches into some local government entities, if there are any local government uh, councils or organisations amongst us, it was probably amongst those organisations that we found data to be even scarcer in terms of its availability and its comprehensible nature. Um, it's probably a function of size, but I also think it's a function of governance and the application of governance across those entities. So um, we had mixed results but we nevertheless made some pretty significant findings in our review. Now, this is just a summary of all the findings we had, but some which I'll highlight for you out of this list is that the governance practices, even at the cabinet level in Western Australia, were poor. We said they were loose um, and they were definitely inadequate, particularly in terms of the quality of information which was being put to government that was supporting the expenditure of tens of billions of dollars. Uh, the structure of government from central agency down had been weakened over the period of time. Public service policy skills uh, had been eroded. Transparency in government in decision making uh, had been eroded. Project management and contract management skills uh, and practices were less than efficient. Statutory bodies, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, really did have a checkered practice in terms of how they managed um, their uh, their data management and their information collections. Accountability agencies, particularly the Auditor General um, and other entities of a similar ilk, um, were not respected uh, in terms of their findings. Um, and the last one I have here is the political class uh, have a low tolerance for hard change. All of those matters, we concluded, underpinned this lack of due process, the deterioration in due process which is seen all the way through activity in day-to-day -day activity, and it ends with records. And um, the, the record management task, as critically important as it is, uh, is seen by too many agencies these days as being something which is at the bottom of the food trade. Uh, and we need to correct that. It, it does need to be called out, uh, and it was called out in our review and I suspect it's going to be called out through these Royal Commissions as well. So I hope you take the opportunity of that. Just in terms of some of the key recommendations we've made in the report, I'm not going to deal with these in any detail because uh, I have promised I'll be brief, but I'll just give you a bit of a sense of what we found of the information we did have, that the Cabinet has to impose the highest standards of governance. That is, the classic statement that the fish rots from the head. Uh, if you take that down to records management, 
one of the things we did notice over this eight-year period was that the cabinet process just was not being uh, governed as rigorously as it could in terms of the demand for the quality of information that was underpinning key decisions. The government must work more closely with its public service in the development and implementation of objectives and major policies, things which you might think would be normal. Definitely in a business environment, the board and senior management work extremely closely. Why isn't that the case in government? And why isn't there the same level of accountability uh, and the demand for uh, the highest levels of information management that you find in the private sector? That the budget process we found had deteriorated over this eight year period to the point where there wasn't one single point in the year where a budget was formed. There was a budget formed each year, but before the budget was passed through the parliament, agencies were seeking more information, or sorry, were seeking uh, new programs. Government agencies needed to work more collaboratively with a common purpose and the old statement of frank and fearless advice across the public service needed to be uh, re restated and we went through quite a range of recommendations in that respect. Um, the development of major projects through state infrastructure needed to be improved. The area of transparency and accountability uh, across the public service uh, needed to be enhanced and the issue of the release of confidential matters um, became somewhat of an art form during the previous period of government. Um, notwithstanding our recommendations that government should be far more transparent with the community and provide information about major contracts that are entered into, um, we find that this issue of um, confidentiality, commercial in confidence calls, it just becomes too enticing for governments and even in this current government we're seeing uh, activities which are replicating the previous administration. And in terms of continuous disclosure and accountability and the use of accountability agencies of monitoring what is going on, um, we said both of those matters needed a, a lot more attention. So in my brief 15 minutes I have available to you, um, that gives you a bit of a sense of what we did in this inquiry. And just going back to where I started, um, we did a lot of that work off the strength of information which we collected from agencies. Um, we did call out those agencies who were not able to provide us with the information we thought was fair and reasonable. Um, and that stays on the public record. Uh, and those agencies hopefully are addressing um, their records management practices. It's just a little concerning though, I have to say, that you need to have an inquiry like this every eight years or so of government to call out these matters. And what is it in terms of our culture, in terms of our discipline of good management that is missing in terms of the public records arrangements? Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Um, I'm now going to introduce Simon Froude, who is the Director of State Records of South Australia. Uh, having 20 years' experience in the government information management environment, Simon is responsible for a number of broad objectives relating to information and archival management, freedom of information and information privacy. His focus over recent years has been to enable organisations to bring real benefits through the management of their information assets. He believes in a government working for the people and supports the use of information through improved access as a way of connecting with citizens. Please welcome Simon. Thank you, Justine, and uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, before I begin, I'd just like to thank the ASA for putting on a wonderful conference here in Perth and for the warm welcome that we've been given from everybody here from WA, so thank you. So what I wanted to talk to you today about um, was really around the question of, of where archives fit within the structure of governments. Um, and so I will um, focus particularly on government archives, but I think, um, I think our role and our responsibilities um, and, and I think that question of, of where we do fit and what those roles and responsibilities are really flows across the sector. Okay. 
I also think um, the case study that I'm going to talk through today, which is a case study about state records of South Australia and what happened to us a few years ago with the proposed um, merger with the State Library, um, is relevant to what's happening across the sector, particularly here in WA, but also in other, other jurisdictions as well. And the changes that are either proposed or are, that are occurring across the sector, um, in my view, have um, the potential to significantly and to the detriment um, impact on the ability of government organisations and organisations generally to ensure good re record keeping and, and to, ensuring, uh, to ensure good governance practices. And um, picking up on what John was saying in terms of what we need to, we seem to need these constant reviews to remind us of the need for good record keeping. I think that situation would only get, would only be worsened if um, the authority and the role of government record keeping organisations and archives is uh, watered down or diminished through administrative change in government. So as a government archive, um, we generally have a number of responsibilities that fall within two aspects of, of, our, of those responsibilities. So the first one is around the record keeping responsibilities. Um, the setting of standards, the provision of advice, training, education, um, audit, compliance, delivery of policy, and ensuring appropriate disposal. These are all things that are key to good governance. Good, re uh, good record keeping underpins a good government. Um, it allows us to support the democratic principles that we uphold, um, the rights and entitlements of individuals. On the other side of our business, though, we have the collection and the need to preserve and maintain the historical records of government and to then be able to provide access to those records as well. And so what that means is that as an organisation, we don't necessarily fit neatly into any one aspect of government. Um, state records of South Australia, for instance, currently resides in the Attorney General's department. Um, we have been recently in the Department of Premier and Cabinet and before that a services division. It's very easy to move archives around government because we don't have that tight fit to a particular aspect of government. There are other archival organisations who, um, because of the collecting nature of our, um, our business, sit within the glam sector, within libraries, with museums and art galleries. Neither of those two different views of where we sit is necessarily wrong. But there are, I think, some things that underpin um, what we need to do as archives. And a lot of that comes back down to the need for us to have our independence and to be able to act with authority on the things that we have legislated to do. And depending where we sit in government might impact on and does impact on the ability for us to exercise that authority. So archives, particularly in the government sector, um, do tread that fine line um, between being an, a glam organisation or a governance organisation. Um, if you speak to uh, many in the um, state libraries or in the library sector, museums, art galleries, um, it, it's, we are not an, um, uh, an organisation or a body that they automatically think of when they think of a cultural organisation or as a, of a collecting organisation. And yet, in many instances, we have some of the largest collections within, within, within our own jurisdictions. We also don't necessarily have the powers that we need within our own legislation to actually be a true governance authority. We don't have necessarily the powers of an ombudsman or an ICAC. Um, we can set standards, yes, we can um, enact disposal authorities, absolutely, but what can we do if those rules and those regulations and those disposal authorities are broken? Very little, generally speaking. And certainly I know from within my jurisdiction, jurisdiction that there's a real frustration um, about the lack of, um, of teeth within the legislation that we have um, to be able to tr really try and um, create a change within um, the, the jurisdiction so that agencies actually do ensure that their record-keeping practices are appropriate. 
So that question of where we fit within the bureaucracy of government, whether we're a glam organisation, whether we're an arts culture, whether we're a governance or accountability, really is key to, I think, um, how we are viewed, but also the authority that we are able to give across the government to enact change, uh, to improve governance, to improve record keeping. I'd just like to spend a bit of time just giving a bit of a, um, if you'll indulge me, a bit of a, a history about our story, the story that State Records went through, because as I said, it is, um, I think, a very relevant um, story for Western Australia um, and for other jurisdictions as well. So the Government Archive in South Australia um, came into existence in 1919 um, with the employment of the first Government Archivist. Um, we celebrate our 100-year birthday next year, so for all of you coming to Adelaide, you can uh, expect cake. Um, that period of time from 1919 through to the sort of 1950s and 1960s, um, we operated as a relatively autonomous organisation. So yes, we reported through what was then the Libraries and Museums Act, um, but we were a fairly autonomous organisation with our, our own um, head of the organisation and with our own rights and responsibilities. That changed, though, during the ninth, from the sort of mid 1960s onwards through to the mid 1980s, where, um, for various reasons, the State Library in South Australia took more control over the running of the archive. That wasn't necessarily due to any change in legislation. It was more due to, I think personalities at the time um, and the, um, the role that the uh, state librarian undertook. That all began to change though in the mid-1980s when there was a real push within South Australia for, um, I, I think that what dawned on people was that there was an understanding that um, the library hadn't been able to give the um, attention that was required to the government record keeping side of the business. Um, yes, the collection was in a good situation, but what was happening out in state and local government agencies was, was really um, systemic poor practice. And that was making the job from a, an archive and collection point of view very difficult. So there was a big push through the 1980s to, to change that. And that came to fruition in the mid-1980s where we became a more autonomous body again. And then through into the, that was sort of culminated in the late 90s where we got the State Records Act of South Australia coming in in 1997. And that act established the Office of State Records as an independent office and gave us some um, rights, roles and responsibilities relating to how we would support government in improving its record keeping. The notion that government had, government agencies had not had the support that they needed both in terms of record keeping and from a disposal perspective um, was one of the key triggers for those changes, but it was also one of the key triggers for the um, implementation through that legislation of the State Records Council as well. So we have a State Records Council that's independent to us but oversees and approves um, disposal determinations and also has the ability to provide advice directly to myself and also directly to the Minister. In 2014, um, when I was six months into um, acting as Director, um, a proposal was put forward from the State Library to um, what they call integrate the State, or state Records into the State Library. That proposal, uh, and at the time we were both parts of the same department, part, part of the Department of Premier and Cabinet, but we had different reporting lines. That proposal was developed directly by the State Library without any consultation with State Records and um, was approved by our then Chief Executive before it even got to me to, to see. So it was, it was pretty much put on our table as a, um, a fait accompli. We were fortunate enough at the time that the proposal requested a review of the proposal to integrate. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a done deal. It wasn't a set in stone that we were going to integrate, but the, the writing was certainly on the wall for us at that time. We, for a number of reasons, didn't support that proposal. Um, 
chiefly because we did feel that with the recent history, and it was literally, you know, we're talking 20 or 30 years before um, that we had been moved out of the control of the library because of the um, lack of support that was given to government agencies. Um, we felt that any move back, any integration back into the state library would be really detrimental to um, how government in South Australia was able to maintain and upkeep its records, which obviously has a flow on effect for the archive and for the community. On, on a whole range of different levels. So working within the bureaucracy, we um, put forward our arguments through the review. We also enlisted the support of the ASA and RIMPA, and they were fabulous in, in really driving a program of um, um, views and bringing together uh, a fairly large supporter base, all of whom were... Um, uh, against the proposed integration. And I think, reflecting back on it now, the, um, the role that the ASA played, the role that RIMPA played, plus other organisations like the Friends of um, South Australian Archives and Genealogy SA, um, really quite um, shocked the government at the time. I don't think they were expecting the outpouring of concern that came from those groups um, and that in some way I think had uh, quite a bit to play in the end re in the result where we ended up <clears throat> so the independent review was conducted over a period of um, about eight months and um, that gave us the ability as I said to to have our say on the matter and to put forward our argument um, one of the things that was of interest through that process was that we were able to, um, I guess, alter some um, untruths about what had been initially proposed in, in the proposal, particularly in relation to the role and responsibilities of state records. I think it came as a bit of a shock to the State Library that our collection was actually bigger than theirs, um, <laughs> and that we had trained archivists. Funny that. Um, it was also an opportunity for us to really um, highlight, um, and, and we took a bit of a risk here, it was, we took the opportunity to highlight that um, the archive collection in South Australia, um, and, I'm a, and it's probably you know, not too dissimilar to many other archival collections around the country, um, it's, not a, it's not a perfect collection. Um, we don't know everything that's in the collection. We don't have everything itemised. Um, it's, it's not a nice, shiny little bauble that the library can play with. Um, it actually comes with inherent risks. It comes with um, a significant cost in terms of maintaining our facilities. It comes with the risk of actually not knowing entirely what's in the collection, of having records in there that probably shouldn't be in there and that should be um, sent back to agencies. So, um, and also, obviously, the preservation uh, and conservation that goes along with a, a collection that's also almost 90 kilometres long. So when the, uh, following the independent review, um, uh, a final report was put down, and that report made um, recommendations for state records to essentially be broken up, um, and they gave three variations on, on that theme, but all of them were essentially around the collection and access side of the business being moved into the state library under, under the control in various degrees to the state librarian. Um, with the uh, record keeping and policy arm of, of the organisation uh, moving over to um, the Department of Premier and Cabinet. We were fortunate enough that, uh, and, then I, and I come back here to the fact that the support that we got from the ASA, RIMPA and other groups was very extremely vocal. Um, many of you might recall the um, um, the work that was done by the ASA, there was um, um, uh, there was a lot of there was online petitions, there was vocal support and demonstrations, and it was it, it worked really well. But one of the things I think it did was it, it took away some of that appetite for our department to actually make the change. So the uh, the re recommendations were passed down in um, December of 2014 and were essentially sat on then by the department for a, f for a number of months because they were um, unwilling, I think, at that time because of the concern that had been raised by the community to take the proposal any, for any further. 
I also think that the State Library started to get cold feet when they saw some of the risks that were attached with um, taking the collection on board. We were, we were fortunate enough in the July of 2015 to be um, moved out of Department of Premier and Cabinet and we were actually um, we mo were moved to the Attorney General's Department as part of a machinery of government change. At around about the same time the State Library was moved to the Department of State Development as it was then and so that created um, for us um, another layer of why the recommendation shouldn't be picked up now that we're actually in separate departments and we have had different reporting lines to different ministers. We were also fortunate that in moving to the Attorney General's Department, um, the Chief Executive at the time had been my boss many, many years before when I was working in Treasury, and uh, we had a very good relationship with him, and he trusted our judgment, he trusted the judgment of the organisation more than he trusted the judgment of the person who had conducted the review, and so we were fortunate then for that review essentially to be shelved. Throughout that whole process, the thing that really struck me from um, a record-keeping and archival perspective was the importance of our independence. This isn't to say, I know, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we should be solely a governance organisation or solely a cultural organisation or, or that we shouldn't from a reporting perspective necessarily sit within an Attorney General's or a Premier and Cabinet or an arts sector. But wherever we reside, our independence is integral to the ability of a State Records Office to be able to do its business. It also came through loud and clear that the support that we get from the executive arm of government and the resourcing that we are allocated is also just as important as our independence. If we are to remain influential in the work that we do and not become impotent, we have to have that independence, we have to have that support and we have to have that resourcing. On closing, my view is that archives can be an easy target for integration or administrative change, however you want to put it. And that's because our role and the value that we bring to the government and to society is not understood or that it's misunderstood. However, in this age of data-driven society, the role of the archive, the role of record keepers is increasingly important. Notions of quality and trust and access are at the very heart of being able to use and manage data for the good of the community. It's important that we make sure that the broader community understand our relevance and that we need to advocate better ourselves and that we need to tell our story better as well. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. And now to our final speaker, David Fricker. <coughs> David, as Director General of the National Archives of Australia, a position he has held since 2012, David Fricker's strategic focus has been on the whole of government transition to digital continuity in records and information management. The expansion of preservation capability for paper, audio, visual and digital records the acceleration of the declassification of sensitive archival documents and the exploitation of emerging technology to enhance the public's access to archival resources. David is currently the President of the International Council on Archives and a Vice Chair of the UNESCO Memory of the World International Advisory Committee. In 2015 he was made Knight of the Order of Arts and Letters. Uh, it's actually a French title and I'm not even going to try to pronounce that. David's French is much, much better than mine. Um, by the Republic of France. Welcome, David. Thank you very, very much, uh, Justine. And thank you so much for mentioning that French knighthood. It, it sounds so much more glamorous than it really is. It's very good. Um, no, look, and, and again, thank you to the uh, ASA for this opportunity. And as a, a 
before I speak, and I also acknowledge the Wajuk Nungyak people uh, as I speak today on the traditional lands of theirs. And I pay my respect to their elders past and present and uh, respects to Aboriginal Indigenous uh, Australians that are here with us today. Um, so my uh, talk is about governance, you know, of the National Archives of Australia, just looking at how our governance uh, is being challenged uh, by the developments in the Commonwealth uh, government arena at the moment. And it is, in a way, it's a neat segue, uh, Simon, from where you just left off in terms of the digital, the data uh, agenda, the whole of government data agenda. Because the, the Commonwealth government um, is, of course, when they think about information policy, our, our Commonwealth government thinks about, OK, it's information, it's information policy framework, it's information technology. And so it becomes a digital transformation uh, issue for government. And so all of the governance that we're up against at the moment, or working within, I should probably say, is driven by that, that, uh, that core policy piece, which is the digital transformation of government. Uh, and that's been largely led by a, and this, there's a pattern that evolves here. And so the, the way that the government has been working on this is to continuously create new institutions. So there's been no appetite to reuse the institutions that we already have there's been this appetite to create new institutions. The first one created was the Digital Transformation Agency. Um, and so that agency, and, and I'm not I'm a dean derogatory here, the, the people, you know, Randall Brugeau is the head of that agency, the people working in that agency are very, very professional, uh, very capable public servants. But that agency uh, is driving the digital transformation of government. And so their mission is to re-engineer the processes by which citizens engage with the Commonwealth Government. And so what they're doing there is to drive down the cost of every transaction, to make that transaction available through a digital channel, uh, and to make that engagement as, uh, as rewarding as possible for the citizen. And their vision uh, of how they're going to do this, um, and their vision, by the way, is for Australia, Australia should be in the top three uh, digital governments of the world. This is now the stated aim of the, the Commonwealth Government. And the vision, or the strategy, I should say, of the Digital Transformation Agency is uh, to construct uh, an environment which is based on a, a very fast, agile mix of uh, software products, of um, information, uh, you know, of hardware, of technical infrastructure, and high connectivity and high bandwidth connectivity. Um, and there's a lot of information, there's a lot of explanation about the, how that stack is going to work, what that architecture is going to be for the digital infrastructure of Australia. Um, but there's just, there's only four words that go to that bottom layer and it says all of this is going to operate on a foundation of well-structured data. And then that's it, that's, that's the, the only bit that's mentioned. Uh, and you can have a long, long look at the website of the Digital Transformation Agency and that's all you will see. Combine that with the Productivity Commission. There was a major report by the Productivity Commission in 2017, uh, and they uh, focused on the availability and use of government data. Uh, and the, the archives made a submission. I, I believe you know there are many uh, very very worthy submissions that were made to that. But you can read and read the Productivity Commission's report. And ironically, for for a commission that's trying to achieve more productivity, they've ended up recommending more and more institutions. And so. You know, there's this, this issue of a consumer right, you know, of, of access to the data. There's issues, uh, you know, we need uh, a data custodian. You know, we need to set up an institution that can sort of accept government information and sort of look after it and, you know, make it available to, to people. And so clearly we need a new institution for that because who could possibly do that? So, so we have these data custodians. And we had, uh, there's a role there for a data commissioner. Um, you know, someone who could oversee the, the proper... Uh, ethical use of data. And this, this drew, in, in both myself and my colleague, the Information Commissioner, we both complained quite publicly about this, saying, well, why are you, we have an Information Commissioner, he's, he's not, and it was a he at the time, he, he's not the, the Commissioner for paper or acetate or microfilm, he's the, he's the Information Commissioner. Why do you need a data commissioner? And similarly, why do you now need this data custodian? You know, we have a National Archives of Australia. Um, and the reason is because all of these, um, all of these initiatives of government, and, and if you read the literature on 
big data. And you read the literature on digital transformation and um, uh, you know, the, the, the re-engineering of government. Everybody, there's an awful lot of literature about data, about big data, about artificial intelligence, about the Internet of Things, about all of these wonderful uh, things, but all of them assume the pre-existence of data. All of the literature you read, with, with very, uh, very few exceptions, but all of it is about this is the way we're going to use data and we're going to be careful because we want to protect privacy and we want to protect confidentiality, uh, we're going to anonymise it or we're going to de-anonymise it or whatever. But it's, it's just based on the premise that it's already there. You know, the data is it's a byproduct. it's the exhaust fumes of society. You know, the data just exists. There's hardly anything, any consideration given to how that data arrived and how good is the data. And the digital transformation there is always uh, approached through the lens of ICT procurement and it's, very, it's a very vendor heavy uh, space. And so all the governance that's been established, almost all, I've got some happy news at the end of this, but all of the, the governance, most of it I should say, around the digital transformation has been around IT procurement uh, and it's been around uh, legislation for data sharing, uh, legislation for anonymisation of data, legislation making it e illegal to, to de-anonymise data um, and you know these sorts of things. But what's missing in all of that is well, where did the data come from? How do you know that data is of any value at all? Um, and this is where uh, the National Archives, this is what's, what we have seen as our, um, our major challenge in terms of governance archives in a changing governance arena. We have really got to be in the mix here. We have got to be part of the government's governance structure to make sure that the, the data as a public resource is actually serving uh, Australia to the maximum effect. And, it, and it's really interesting that, you know, the, the, a lot of what we've been hearing about at this conference and, and the, the, the um, presentation this morning from Claire um, Coleman uh, around you know, if you're going to have records, rec records have got to be um, representative of Australia. You know, there's big data is feeding AI, is feeding, you know, increasing levels of automation across Australia, it's feeding into policy development. Now, if all of that data is just data about, you know, it's data that's been produced by um, software, uh, the most successful software produces the most data, and so that's the data that will feed our policy. Well, you're going to have policy designed for white-skinned, English-speaking, you know, um, people, you know, middle-class Australians. That's the policy. You won't get policy designed for those who are underrepresented in the data sets, you know, that have just been created as a byproduct of economic activity or, or whatever. And so there's an ethical issue here. We've got to make sure that the, that the data that's driving the government of Australia is data that truly represents uh, the people of Australia, the needs of Australians, all Australians, and it's inclusive and it's just. Uh, and it, and it, it lives into the future. So all of, that, uh, all of our governance uh, challenges at the moment within the National Archives has been to inject ourselves into this, into this uh, these, you know, with data commissioners and with uh, data custodians and, uh, and everything else. Now it is the case that there's a, excuse me, <clears throat> there's a lot of data which are not records. You know, data is Data is data, you know, there's, there's an abundance of data, we know that. Um, you, you can't do anything without creating data of some sort. And so it's not to say that every bit of data uh, constitutes a record, and even every record that is created constitutes something of, of high uh, temporary value or of, of enduring archival value. But nonetheless, um, all records these days in the digital world, uh, all records are made up of data. and so all of that data that's being created has to be created by government and managed in a way that recognises archival value uh, and is included properly in the decision making and policy making of government. And so our governance uh, that we're introducing through our policies and through our participation uh, across the various uh, policy committees, across the various whole of government proposals, uh, etc., is bringing to the fore that, okay, if, if the digital transformation has got that sort of architecture there on a foundation of well-structured data, then you know, we've got a governance uh, structure that says, OK, what a founda foundation means, uh, it is genuinely foundation, it's solid, it's going to last long enough to support 
immediate future long-term initiatives, uh, that it is well-structured data, but let's go further than just saying it's well-structured. It's meaningful, it's authentic, it holds uh, government to account, uh, and it has long-term utility. It's, it's interoperable over time, as well as interoperable across all activities of government. And also that it's ethical. Uh, the data that's created by government has got to be ethical. It has to be inclusive. It has to be data about the, the ugly stuff. It's got to be data about the pretty, the pretty stuff that we do. But most of all, it has to be representative uh, of all of the activities uh, of government and representative of all the Australians. Uh, there's also broader issues here. The, the, you know, we, we also uh, need to concentrate more on promoting our role in supporting the sustainable development goals of the, the United Nations. Um, because as many of you will know, there's, there's several goals in there that depend on governments having information about their population. You know, you, uh, goal uh, 17 uh, says that all governments are going to have good quality information about the populations, uh, the, the socio-economic circumstances of the populations, where they live, what their needs are, etc. So we can't achieve that. Australia cannot achieve that unless we have uh, authentic, complete, uh, comprehensive information. Goal 16 as well is about building trust uh, in institutions, having uh, institutions which uphold values of transparency, integrity and accountability. And I know there's whole conferences of themselves just talking about the public's trust in institutions and this is another thing where we have got to inject ourselves into these governance arrangements to say that this, this whole of government data agenda also has to uphold uh, those sustainable development goals but also achieve those outcomes. Now it, is, it, is, um, it does get me into trouble sometimes um, and, and people in this room, I'm sure, will be able to leap to their feet in a moment and tell me where I'm going wrong. But part of what we, we have to do in this is to appropriate more and more language of the tech sector. And so, you know, we don't, you do see the National Archives now talking more and more about data, talking more and more about information. And sometimes, as a professional group, we sort of say, well, hang on, what about the record? You know, you're not, you're not talking about records enough. You know, we're talking about information management and information policy, but record, the word record has a meaning, the word archive has a meaning. Now it is, and that is the case. And so what we're trying to do is appropriate as much of the language as we need to from the tech sector so that people at the instant of creation, people recognise that data is actually valuable data and if you aggregate that data with a bit more data you get a record and then if you consider that within a whole of government activity, well then maybe you'll have some records of uh, temporary value, you'll have some records of long-term value and indeed archival value. And so this is still continues to be a challenge for us to actually be able to inject ourselves into those conversations and, uh, and, and you know, through the appropriate use of language, through the appropriate promotion of our policies to make sure that the digital transformation governance arrangements uh, are indeed including that all-important layer which is called data in there but actually what we are talking about are the archival resources of the Commonwealth and in the temporary sphere what we're talking about are authoritative, authentic, effective records upon which uh, the just, ethical, efficient and effective activities of government can be conducted. So that's, that's sort of, if you like, a very quick, uh, Justine, I will, I will stop it there, but that's where we are in terms of uh, governance at the moment and that's where we have to be positioned to make sure that archives in the current governance ecosystem of the Commonwealth Government is actually adding value and is being included from the most junior to the most highest levels uh, of government. So I'll leave it there and I'll be pleased to discuss it further. Thank you, Justine. Thank you. Okay, so we now open up for questions. Plenty of time for questions. Um, can I ask you to wait till the microphone gets to you and say your name before asking a question? Thank you. There is a question over here and there is another one over here and another one over there. So we've got a few lined up. Shall I go first? Yes. Uh, my question is for John Longlon. John, thanks for that report on the special projects and your revelations about record keeping. 
Um, I may get the statistic wrong, but it seems that in terms of information governance and critical failures in information management, something like about 50% of the agencies that you investigated demonstrated a problem. What confidence do you have going forward that any of your concerns raised in your report will be addressed? My understanding is that as a consequence of the 2017 government review, resources available to the State Records Office, information management, information governance have been further reduced. So how can one be confident about your recommendations being taken seriously? Fair question. Um, <clears throat> if I took it into a more macro position, I am optimistic that the findings of this inquiry will get greater attention than the previous ones, primarily because the government has established um, infrastructure, that is, they've created groups within the, particularly the Department of Premier and Cabinet to develop this, and Cabinet has actually seen it as being a priority. So there's a, there's a subcommittee of the Cabinet which is actually overseeing the um, implementation of the recommendations that came not only from my report but from others. Um, with respect to what confidence do I have with res on records, um, it's not high. Uh, primarily because I was struck by the fact that not only did agencies um, not see the merit of recording developments um, and maintaining data as being a priority, um, some of them didn't even see the need. And this was a problem. So to go to David's point, we can, we can manage and maintain everything, but what's, what is it that we're actually managing and maintaining? And what's that quality of, of that issue? Um, so that's where I think the attention has to go to. Uh, the, the calling out of the need to have better quality information and better quality data, if you have a look through the 31 chapters of the report, particularly on the different agencies, in almost every instance we either said the information availability was good or we, or we said the opposite. We said it was poor and needed to be addressed. And in a couple of instances we said the boards which were overseeing those agencies should address this problem. Now that's about as much as we can do. Hopefully those boards will pick it up. Um, it's a systemic issue which we have not just in our public service but I think across uh, all areas of, of, um, of, of business practice in the broader sense. So we need to raise the attention to it and um, uh, we need to call it out more. I'm hoping the Royal Commissions will say something about it. Uh, hopefully we'll have more Productivity Commission reports. Hopefully in particular we'll have accountability agencies like Auditors General and others um, come out and say this just isn't adequate. It needs to be picked up and, and I'm hoping that um, because there's a theme through our report that leave aside where the political process is that the bureaucrats will actually pick this up at the senior level. So there's a, if you like, there's an awakening of the senior bureaucrats within Western Australia as a result of this report saying we have to lift our standards and hopefully records management is part of that. So I just wanted to just say a few words um, uh, when, on, on, that, that, on that issue. When I, when I first started working um, in state records um, back in the late 90s, um, everyone I spoke, one, part, of, part of our role was to go out and talk to government agencies and, and one of the things that records keepers were crying out for was a disaster. They wanted a disaster to get attention, um, to make so that we could get change. Um, we've had We've had those disasters. We've had royal commissions into child sexual abuse. We've had the Stolen Generation report. We've had multiple royal commissions, multiple inquiries, multiple ombudsman's reports, all of which at some point in time come back to the failure of record keeping and governance across government bureaucracies and yet nothing has changed. So we have to do something different. We have to do something more to affect that change because it's not working at the moment. Uh, coincidentally, that's, that's pretty much a similar question to what I had. Um, forgive my ignorance, but um, if there's no, there's, there's seemingly no consequences for agencies, you, you know, uh, John, you mentioned that, that 
you know, every eight years you're doing inquiries and, and you're getting agencies who say, sorry, I, I can't find the records or sorry, we didn't keep the records. Um, that seems very convenient, particularly if they want to hide something, but um, I mean, what are the, are the, are there any consequences? I mean, agency, if agencies got their budgets cut when they didn't keep their records adequately, if they, if they were actually measurable consequences, we wouldn't need to convince them to keep their records because there would be substantial problems for them if they didn't. Um, I mean, is there, is there any, has there ever been any sort of talk of that, of punishing agencies who do not keep records adequately? <laughs> Um, I'll start, the other guys might have something to say. Um, one of the things which we called out in our report was, so where are the consequences for this behaviour? Um, we looked at it in the, in, from the point of view, um, not of records management, but in terms of um, qualified audits. So financial management, kind of important um, uh, across the community, and yet in this jurisdiction, I regret to say, Agencies, some agencies were getting sequential qualified audits, that is year in, year out, qualified audits, no consequence. Everyone just carried on, um, uh, yet when I became the chair of the Power and Water Corporation in the Northern Territory, that organisation had had two successive qualified audits. And um, when I was actually discussing my appointment with the Treasurer, I said, well, the first thing we've got to do is get out of qualified audits, because it's just, in, it, it is culturally Develop, it, it develops a culture within the organisation that who cares? Um, and you have to change that. So I, I think there's a real responsibility on senior managers uh, across organisations to raise standards. And I'm, I'm hopeful that as this government prosecutes a number of these recommendations, standards will rise. Um, but I am a born optimist. like it's a uh, mock the week, you know, when you have to run up to the... <laughs> um, look, on that, um, yeah, we, we talk about this a lot, you know, where are the consequences? There, look, and there are consequences. It's not always uh, outwardly visible, but often uh, it's that the record keeping is the root cause of, uh, you know, a mistake that's been made, transgression by the, by the, the government agency. If I, from the National Archives' point of view, I'm talking about government agencies. Um, and, you know, big example. So if, if it is just, if you've just been detected that um, your agency is exhibiting poor record keeping behaviour, then that's the same as getting an audit report that says your security practices are a bit lax, um, that, you know, some of your financial arrangements need to be tightened up. You get a qualified audit or something like that. And so there's no major consequence, but, with, you know, internally, every, you know, you'll fix your financial procedures, you'll fix your record keeping. Bond. But time and time again, you know, the pink bats, uh, event, you know, there was a lot in that report. What led to that that dreadful outcome? And it was it was poor information management, poor record keeping. In fact, they call it record keeping. Going back quite a few years with the um, immigration, uh, the Cornelia Rao uh, incident, where that that poor woman um, wasn't a citizen, but she'd been you know deported um, because of inadequate record keeping. Why didn't they know? Why didn't we know that this woman was a citizen of Australia? And, and so what you see is that there are disasters that um, had, have occurred, but the root cause is tracked back and is very, you know, it is very specifically addressed that these are very inadequate uh, record keeping, irresponsible negligence in terms of record keeping. And as a part of the consequences, there are major changes made. So in the case of the Cornelia Rao, that Department of Immigration as it was then, they got turned upside down and a lot of that was about better um, better, better systems, but also better record keeping. Now, they're still not there yet, of course. My, our poor cousins in immigration, it's a well, home affairs now. Um, but the same with the pink bats uh, thing, that, that awful you know, outcome there with four, four young people dying. And, you know, so there are, there are consequences. But what makes headlines is not you know, bad record keeping. What makes headlines is the consequence, the awful consequence uh, of poor record keeping. But honestly, internally, you know, that it is um, plenty of consequences. More recently, which, which is more sort of fun, I suppose, than a tragedy, was the, um, the filing cabinets of Commonwealth Records that got, you know, given away. Uh, and then the ABC picked them up. And they, they were in a shed for a while before they, they got given to the ABC. Now, yeah, you know, we, we laugh about it. And, and I think it's been resolved now and they're all back. But 
behind the scenes, let me tell you, you know, the AFP were called in to investigate that. Uh, the Rick Smith, the former uh, Secretary of uh, the Defence Department, was, was engaged by the Head of Prime Minister and Cabinet to do a thorough no-nonsense uh, review, and there have been major consequences internally, right across the public service, to, to address that image. And so, you know, behind the scenes, there have, have really been some serious consequences in the way that agencies are now expected to conduct themselves around record keeping. But you know, it's not it's not a sexy headline to say, you know, poor record keeping. Uh, so you won't that won't make the page, but the front page, but certainly the the terrible, you know, treatment of those records made the front page when the ABC started publishing that they had cabinet documents. So yes, yeah, so there, honestly there are consequences, you know, and I don't I, I don't think we should forget that. We do have an effect but it's, it's a sort of an effect of a daily grind and a constant vigilance that does maintain the levels that we do maintain across, and I think it's across all jurisdictions, not only the Commonwealth. Thank you. It's a bit like musical chairs up here. Um, I, I think if you, look at, um, if you look at the legislation that governs um, record keeping authorities and archives, most, most of those pieces of legislation have to greater or lesser degrees um, uh, the ability for organisations to be charged or to be held to account for poor record keeping. Um, the difficulty is in actually applying that and, and getting the support to, a, to apply that. So from, for instance in, our, in the State Records Act for South Australia, um, it is, it's a criminal offence punishable by a $10,000 fine or two years imprisonment to um, knowingly and intentionally destroy an official record. That's fine. It's great that it's in the Act. It's never been used because I would literally have to be standing over the person telling them about the State Records Act and they can't destroy it whilst they're shredding the document to be able to make sure that it's knowingly and with intent. And they'd actually have to be telling me, I understand and I'm still going to do it. <laughs> so that's, that's, part of the dif that's part of the difficulty. Um, I, think, I think, though, that we need to reframe the way we come at it. I'd, I'd, that there is a time and a place for, um, for charges like that. Um, and actions like that. But I think we need to come at it more from a point of view of building in to people's understandings the benefits of actually doing it properly rather than say you're going to be hit over the head with a stick if you do it incorrectly. So we have to sell the value of doing good record keeping and good archival management. And that really takes us back a whole number of years where um, record keeping archival management was just a part of good practice in government. It wasn't seen as something that was um, distinct or separate from the process of good governance. It was actually inbuilt into that and we need to get back to that. Rather than having the records keepers and the archivists in the basement as their own little business unit, we actually need to get back to the, the, the place where it's ingrained in the processes and the transactions and, and the di digital transformation gives us that opportunity. So I think that's what we need to, we need, really need to grasp that. There's a question in the middle there, and then another one here. I was a records management consultant for about 30 years in Western Australia um, to private enterprise and government, familiar with some of the organisations that John named, their record keeping or lack of it. Um, and um, following on in part from what Simon said, one of the things that I'm beginning to think of is um, do we need to go to a model almost like, and one of the countries I used to also consult in was Singapore, there they have a civil service college and public servants need, usually at about by middle management stage, they have to have had to have done some courses in basically how to be a good public servant in the Westminster system, all of that sort of thing. Now that might be turning the clock back because once upon a time, a very long time ago, we used to have something somewhat similar. 
And I'm wondering if that is what needs to be also introduced in a way as leading up to make so that people will in government and private enterprise will leave aside for a moment, but public servants really will understand their responsibilities in terms of record keeping. I was involved in also doing record keeping training across agencies, but you'd go in for a day or half a day and do a spiel and then leave and, you know, everybody had ticked that off type of thing. Okay, so, <laughs> comment to the question, I guess, is a good idea. Um, look, I, from a personal point of view, I, I really strongly support your, what, where you're going with that thinking because I think, if I can speak about the Australian Public Service, um, one of the things, one of the problems we have in the APS is that we have all become generalists and, uh, and that's, that's what's led to so much red tape incidentally, you know, why procurement is so difficult and recruitment is so difficult and dealing with workplace harassment is so difficult is because you can't rely on anyone to do it properly and so you have to scrutinise to death you know, everything that people have and involve five people in committees of 100 to do everything. If, if we had a more professional public service, then the whole place would operate far more effectively, would all be far more personally accountable for what we do and conducting ourselves in, in ethical and effective manner. Uh, so I, I do think that's, uh, that's a really that is, I don't think that's old fashioned thinking, I think that's quite modern thinking in, in my own mind. Um, because after all we're spending public money, we're using public resources, we have to be far more professional and publicly accountable. You know, the, with, um, uh, you know, the National Archives once played a bigger role than it does today in providing that sort of expertise to, um, to, to foster a higher level of uh, record keeping across the Commonwealth. Uh, I, I, I apologise, but through, that's one of those things through efficiency dividends that we no longer do. In, under my watch, we have pulled back on the training that we used to provide uh, across Commonwealth agencies. We do that now more through, um, uh, you know, with, with sort of video type assistance, or we do it through the resources on our website, or we do it through e-learning uh, things. Now, e-learning is a wonderful invention, but it's never going to be as good as sitting in a classroom and you know, talking to someone and learning that way. So it is, it is one of those things that through efficiency dividends and through finding uh, cheaper ways to deliver it, I don't mind saying, I think we've seen the level of professionalism come down. As part of our digital continuity policy, we were very deliberate to include uh, the appointment of a chief information governance officer uh, within every government entity. So at least there's somebody in the organisation who's got some sort of qualification to tell the accountable authority you're doing information governance properly or you're not. So that's our, that's our part of what we're doing to impose that level of professionalism across uh, public service entities. And, and also the, our more online resource, but publishing our capability matrix in a, what sort of skills every public servant should have uh, to be able to uh, perform effective record keeping. But you know, look, I do, I, I'm, I'm more than nostalgic for those days. That was my experience joining the public service in the late 1970s. I, I had a good you know, day uh, with a very tough instructor on record keeping and, and how to do that properly um, in the public service. So, so it's you know, something I think we do need to keep thinking about. Um, but uh, yeah, perhaps through some of these governance you know, initiatives and, and things we're talking about, we can continue to try and instill that. But I think it's more than record keeping. I, you know, financial management is woeful. As I say, recruitment, procurement, understanding of legal frameworks, accountability frameworks. Nobody can write. You know, just getting someone who can actually write is, is really hard. So it's a, it's a whole issue of professionalism. We've all just become too generalist, I think. But that's another conference as well. If I can just add briefly. Um, yeah. Yes, we've, we've become very modern up here. Um, I asked Justine just to find that page in the presentation. You'll see the last dot point, which went right to where David was about the training issue. Um, and then pick up on Simon's commentary a bit earlier. One of the things we've forgotten to do, I think, as we bring people into the workforce is actually train them. I mean, I was just reflecting that in, I'll give away somewhat of my age, in 1975 when I joined the Commonwealth Treasury, uh, having spent four years at university and thought I knew everything, about the first year and a half, I uh, proofread, maintained files of information, 
did basic data management. Um, I wasn't trusted, if you like, to do anything more sophisticated than that, but more particularly, that was just a training um, that was there for young people coming into the workforce. I'm not sure you could do that today um, with the current generation, but in our, um, one of the findings you'll find in our report, we say the public service needs to effectively go back to school to learn how to be a public servant and to understand some basic principles and practices you have to encounter as a, as a public servant managing with large budgets. We also said that members of parliament and members of the cabinet should do the same training. So if you want to become a company director in Australia, you're really well advised to go out and do an AICD course. It takes five days, it's intensive, you learn a lot. To become a minister of the crown, you've just got to get elected and then suddenly you can be managing tens of billions of dollars. No wonder we have outcomes like we have. There's a question in the middle there. Thank you, Justine. Catherine Kasakis, State Archivist, Western Australia. I want to pick up on um, a comments that a number of you have made, including speakers in the audience, just in terms of the WA context, in terms of consequences. Um, they are enshrined in our legislation. Like you, Simon, we have a fine, $10,000. It's never been uh, applied. Um, so um, not sure that it really has any teeth either in WA. Um, however, in terms of our information um, records management structure, we have a state records commission um, that the SRO is accountable to. And um, with outcomes such as the Langelant report, we go back to our government agencies and ask them in their next iteration of their record keeping plan to explain what they have done to meet the um, uh, recommendations or the findings of, the, of various reports. And these go up to the commission for approval. Our commission has the capacity to report directly to parliament. They are not accountable to a minister. They can report directly to parliament. They have not yet exercised that option, it has to be said. But I wanted to say that one of the challenges for the archive sector is that we are both the accountability agency um, holding the, the stick, but we are also the agency responsible for supporting government in good practice. So I actually have in the WA legislation, it is enshrined that I will um, monitor compliance with the legislation and I will also provide training to government agencies on what they need to be doing. And neither of those are appropriately um, resourced. So we're really not able to provide better support to government agencies in WA. And I, I do think that as a result, our state does um, suffer in that regard. Thank you. Any response to that comment from our panelists? Uh, look, I just think it's, um, they're critically important comments. And as each of us have said, I think, in answers to other questions, you've just got to find ways of calling it out. And I think you've got to be quite strategic in using other entities to call it out. Productivity commissions, auditors general, ombudsmen's, just go to them all the time and say to them, you know, are you observing X, Y, and Z, and why aren't you commenting on it, and why don't you keep raising the importance of this? Because you can do it, um, but it's always better when someone else with equal credibility is saying it for it for you as well. So, my encouragement to you is, uh, don't get despondent, don't get disappointed. I know funding's been cut across all areas of government, including yours but keep calling this out. It is too important not to. Do we have any other questions? I do have a question. Um, I know uh, when I go out and talk to senior executives in my own government, um, one of the, and a lot of them are supportive of records management, it's just that it has low visibility usually within their within their departments and agencies. And one of the things they have asked me for is a set of simple metrics that they could use to assess the performance of their own agencies in the area of records management. Because they have understood the 
correlation between poor records management and poor outcomes, but they don't have any metrics with which to judge their own performance. So I want to throw it out to our panellists and perhaps to the audience as well. What are, what are some of the metrics that we could supply to the heads of government agencies to help them to understand how their own agency is actually performing in the area of records and information management? <laughs> it is a tricky question. Oh no, look, it is, it is a tricky question from um, both, you know, coming up with metrics but also to make them relevant, you know, to, to as, as we've been saying, to have consequences. Now we've, again, just, well, our experience, so we've had a crack at this with our checkup um, digital. So the, the archives, we do uh, an annual survey and every second year in, in more depth we do an annual uh, survey and cross checkup. Um, uh, in, in recent years, this has been refined to make it absolutely uh, mandatory for the head of the department to sign off on the results as well. So that was the first thing, to, to have a, each entity to do a self-assessment of the effectiveness of their records management. And these are based on you know, quite specific questions. You know, how, many of your, how much of your data is under a formal you know, um, records management regime? Um, you know, et cetera, and on it goes. And also we've, we ask for evidence, you know, so provide that, that document to substantiate this, um, this uh, your answer. And, uh, and so each agency does get a score on how well it is doing, and then that goes to the secretary of the department or the, the agency head, and then that gets returned back to the archives. We then report that to our minister each year, and every three years there's a report to the prime minister. So, so that's, that's the best that um, my very capable staff at the National Archives can come up with, and it's a fantastic, it's very well established, it's, it's quite good. We have had really good, um, we can see positive results that, you know, the statistics do go up, we're up to about 80% of, um, uh, if I can just grab one figure out of there, 80% of uh, government information, if you like, and agencies are now have proper digital information management. And, but the other really good one that I do get back is that because of these uh, checkup surveys being signed off by the agency head, uh, records managers are very, we get favourable feedback saying that the record management people saying actually now my senior management does take it more seriously because it was, had to come across their desk, they had to fess up to the, you know, and they see the report that okay their department and like some important, the Department of Finance in, in, in the federal department is a very poor performer and they're, they're shown on the, the overall graph that it's a very poorly performing agency. And so the Secretary of the Department of Finance now has to sign off to say, yep, I'm in the lowest quartile of government agencies with information management. It, this, this has an effect. So I'm not saying it's, you know, it's, it's the magic dust that's sort of solving the problem, but it is having an effect. Um, and so if you like, that metric is probably the most important one, is what's my ranking? What, where am I on the leaderboard? Uh, and if I'm, a, if I'm supposed to be a high-performing central agency, I should be way up the leaderboard and I'm not. Um, but it's interesting. Most of the central agencies are the worst performers, is the way it seems to, to go. So that is, you know, something. And again, you know, it's uh, it's, it's available. You know, people can find the, the checkup uh, survey on our on our website and have a look, or, or talk to us here uh, for what remains of the conference. But I, I reckon it's tricky, though. That to, to your central point, though, I'd be interested in your um, answer to this one, Justine, because <laughs> to find those metrics that do actually have consequence, have genuine importance. I would lose my job if I didn't achieve this metric. Uh, I, that is, that continues to be a challenge. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, similarly to NAA, we, we have a, 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 an ability under our legislation to survey agencies and then to report inadequate records management practices back to our minister. Um, we implemented a, a a survey process in 2010 which we repeated in 2014 and we used that as a way to um, identify agencies what levels they were at in terms of their record keeping maturity um, and then to see four years later how they progressed and within in the meantime they were they were putting in place activity plans to essentially work on the areas where they were um, uh, not performing as well um, I think part of the problem though, uh, and I, Justine, I notice you, you used the word simple metrics. I think that's, that's where it gets difficult because our survey was, I, I think from memory, sort of 400 questions. Now, that's not simple. 
Um, and it doesn't give simple results either. It gives very complex, very detailed answers that agencies then need to go away with. Um, so I think we as a, I think we as a profession and, and absolutely as a state and territory and national archives need to look at um, a simple way of doing that so that we can give something to the executive that they can actually use and understand. Um, I think one of the things that we miss in all of this is understanding what the value is of the record or of the information to the business. Um, and we don't really look at the value um, as, a, as a metric. And, and I think that is something that would probably get the attention of the chief executives and of the secretaries because they, they understand budget, they understand money. And, and putting a value around your information in terms of what the value is now, what it might be in the future and what it could be if it's used and reused, it could send a really important message. Any other questions? Right, one thing. Um, if, if there aren't any questions, but um, just while you're thinking about the next question, and it, it sort of relates back to Catherine, the point you were making as well, I should say something about CARA and about the, um, uh, the, the Council of Australasian and um, uh, whatever it stands for, Archives and Records Authorities. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, yeah, I know, that's right. It's too complicated. Um, but look, this, this is something, and because we don't actually talk very much about what we don't talk enough, I don't think, about what CARA does. But um, uh, so CARA has been spending an awful lot of time talking about this lately. And Catherine, you have done an awful lot of work on this as well and contributed a great deal to our strategies of what we are going to do. And is it too early? Can I talk about what, what we're planning on doing? Do I have my permission of my CARA members? You've got one minute. One minute. Okay, I'll be quick. <laughs> but look, one thing we are doing is... Uh, and we haven't quite nutted out all the details for announcement, but we, we are joining forces across all of the jurisdictions, including New Zealand, incidentally, uh, to engage a highly respected or, you know, authoritative uh, figure to uh, come in and conduct a really thorough review of the extent to which all of our uh, bureaucratic arrangements, our legislative frameworks, our regulatory frameworks, our governance arrangements, the extent to which that genuinely does properly and adequately serve the needs of all of our respective governments and through that you know, deliver the public good that should be being delivered. So we've just, as I say, we've got a bit of nothing out to do to just to, to refine that, but um, it is something, and, and again, full credit to, uh, to Catherine for driving this uh, in particular. Um, so it is something that we can do as CARA if we join forces and speak, if you like, as a quasi non-government organisation to say, well, hang on, there, Australia is, is kind of sleepwalking into some really serious problems here, um, then, you know, it, this may also have some sort of effect. So CARA is also trying to, to do something at a higher level to address this issue. And, and again, I repeat, New Zealand is also um, working with us on that as well. So uh, Richard Foy from New Zealand. That's my minute. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. OK, we are out of time, so I'd like to thank all of the panel members today. <laughs> And I'd like to thank all of you for participating as well. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs>